Good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Shibley. I'm the Dean here at the School of Architecture and Planning and welcome to the first Clarkson lecture to happen in this hall. Um, we have had 26 years of Clarkson chairing and um, uh, I am pleased uh, again for the 4,354th time to say thank you to Will and Nan Clarkson for this scholarly gift to the School of Architecture and Planning. It has enabled a troop of outstanding international scholars to come not for a day, but mostly for a week, to really get to know us and for us to get to know them. This evening's talk and speaker are no exception. It's an extraordinary individual, and I will ask our Clarkson Chair Coordinator, Samina Raja, to introduce him in just a minute. You're sitting in Hayes Hall. Um, many of you may know that it was a former insane asylum. Uh, it has been renovated recently to now accommodate 250 people at a lecture. And I'm glad to see 250 people here. It's wonderful. Uh, our previous uh, lecture hall would handle about 108. So we feel like we've come full, full circle here and ready, ready to do what we can do here. Um, I, I want to say just a little bit about this hall and this building. Uh, it was designed originally by George Metzger, who is uh, uh, an architect from Erie County. It was his first commission as an architect, and he was 17 years old. I want to welcome this contingent of students from our local high school who work uh, proudly for the Massachusetts Avenue project. Town. I thank you for your attendance and never let anybody tell you you can't do it. All right? George did this project in, in the 1870s, came back around and did the men's and women's dorm on the central facility in uh, 1888. And then uh, in 1927, the building after going through a migration of insane asylum, um, uh, county almshouse, and home for unwed mothers became appropriately the uh, uh, new home of the University of Buffalo as it moved from downtown to the northern edge of our city. Um, in, in that capacity, uh, Samuel Capon occupied the first president's office in on this campus. Um, so th that's probably enough history except to say you might want to come back and get the full tour because you're sitting in a cousin of the Richardson Center Psychiatric Center. Same party, center, center building and wings, dorms for men and dorms for women. Um, it has the cells where we now keep the faculty. <laughs> And, and it has the salons that are opposite that, where the seminars, classrooms, and the occasional dean hang out. So with that, I'm going to turn you over to Samina, who will introduce our speaker this evening and tell you a little bit about uh, just how significant an individual we have with us today. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Welcome. How are you all? Thank you. My name is Samina Raja. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning and your Clarkson Week host for tonight. It is an honor to be hosting this event with a distinguished scholar and I will introduce him shortly. But I wanted to kick off by quickly touching on a couple of historic moments. One being that we are in Black History Month, but also that our school has a tradition of inviting guests that challenge us to think differently. Many years ago, William Kunstler spoke in our school. He was a civil liberties attorney who um, represented, among other people, <coughs> Martin Luther King. So this is a historic time again. It's a challenging time, but one in which our university and school can play a leading role. And that conversation that our school carries forward is made possible, as Bob pointed out, by the generosity of Will and Nan Clarkson. Th 
through their support, we have been able to invite distinguished scholars and professionals to campus for lectures and seminars that engage students, faculty, practitioners, and members of the public, including our very young members of the city of Buffalo. The Clarkson Visiting Chair is an endowed visiting position awarded semi-annually to a distinguished scholar or um, in recognition of his or her excellence in the pursuit of scholarship and application within our disciplines. Thank you, Will and Nan, for your support. This year, we are pleased to recognize Professor John A. Powell as the 2017 Clarkson Chair in Urban and Regional Planning. As Clarkson Chair, he has been in residence at UB this week, sharing his wisdom with students, faculty, policy, and grassroots leaders on and off campus and through the lecture such as one tonight. In addition to the generous support that we receive from the Clarkson Chair Program, this week's event is also made possible through a grant from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and with the generous partnership and support of community organizations, in particular Crossroad Collective, which is a coalition of community organizations working toward a more just and inclusive Buffalo. Thank you also to the Clarkson Program Planning Team, specifically Anjali Hall, Shannon Phillips, Madeleine Britt, and several members of the UB Food Lab team who have been working to get all of you here. Of course, none of this would have been possible without explicit support for equity and inclusion from leadership at all levels of the university. So, our guest. It's a challenge to introduce him. He will introduce himself through his words, and I promise you, you will be pleasantly surprised and grateful for his wisdom. Our distinguished Clarkson Chair, John A. Powell, is a globally recognized scholar in the areas of civil rights and civil liberties who writes about a wide range of issues, including structural racism, ethnicity, housing, poverty, and democracy. He is the executive director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at the University of California, Berkeley, a professor of law and professor of African American studies and ethnic studies. He also holds the Robert D. Haas Chancellor's Chair in Equity and Inclusion. He is an institution builder, having founded and led both the Kerwin Institute of Race and Ethnicity at OSU, Ohio State, and the Institute of Race and Poverty at the University of Minnesota School of Law. A widely published and acclaimed scholar, much of Professor Powell's early work shaped how planning practitioners and scholars understand and implement the idea of opportunity mapping in communities today. So students, if you have heard of opportunity mapping, you get to meet the man behind it. Through his work, John Powell asks difficult questions and manages to offer empathetic and well-reasoned guidance. His most recent book, Racing to Justice, draws on decades of thinking about social justice, spirituality, law, and philosophy to map a blueprint for us so we can lay claim to our shared humanity. In uncertain times, his words provide clear guidance for planners and community leaders on how to create cities and regions where all belong. Please join me in welcoming our 2017 Clarkson Chair in Urban and Regional Planning, Professor John Powell. Let's stay here for one minute. Someone help me do the thing on the social compound. So uh, it's a delight to be here, but before I let Sam uh, Samina go, uh, we have just issued, today is the a launching day of a social compact on values that we think are critical for our society and our democracy. And you can go and look at it, but I'm going to have Samina give you some instructions in case you tweet. Uh, we want you to start tweeting this and... Um, Would you like me to share the website? Yeah, how about you? Okay. I don't tweet, so you have to. <laughs> My office tweets for me. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
while she's pulling that up, let me join in thanking the Clarksons. I had dinner uh, with the Clarksons last night and got a chance to sit next to Nan, and uh, it was just a delight. And I want to give you a special thanks for uh, this lecture, but also what you do for the school. Um, so I'll turn it back to Samina for a minute. So Professor Powell is referring to this new social compact that I'm sure he'll talk about. But if you are the kind who tweet and go on Facebook, millennials, please use hashtag commit to, which is on the screen. You can also use hashtag new social compact and of course hashtag you buffalo. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of things, but again, I want to just acknowledge where I am here in Buffalo, here at the other UB. I'm at, at a different UB. Um, I, I had a wonderful time interacting with the faculty and look forward to more of that tomorrow, the students and some of the community le leaders. Um, and you're dealing with a number of things, and I want to sort of give you a framework to help you continue to deal with some of those things. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, design, inclusion, belonging, and, um, and other things. I'll start by suggesting that the problem of the 21st century is the problem of othering. And that's a problem that's a global problem. As we sort of witness the mass migration that's happening, by some account, uh, 300 million people, which is the size of the United States, will be moving from the global south to the global north. What is equally interesting, or maybe even more interesting, is that most of the migration is happening from the south to the south. So the more immigrants uh, moving around in Africa, for example, than from Africa to Europe. Uh, we oftentimes don't pay attention to that. Uh, how we actually think of and how we embrace uh, people who are along some axis that appear different from us is the problem of the 21st century. Uh, and so there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. One is that these people are other. They're different than us. Or to think that they belong. Now every society has a way of actually thinking about belonging and othering. And in the United States, in some ways one could say, as Michael Omi and Howard Winnett do does, that the master category for othering in the United States is race. So it doesn't mean it's the only category, but it means it's the one that actually informs the way the United States thinks not just of the other, but how it thinks of itself, how it thinks of its systems and structures. So in that sense, even when we think about the structure of our societies, the structure of our cities and suburbs, without mentioning race, race informs how we do that in the United States. So this rapid change is actually creating a great deal of churning in the United States. And these are two authors. One, Samuel Huntington, you may recognize him. He wrote a book called The Class of Civilization. The other one, uh, Jeff Chang. So they're both dealing with the same phenomena, that the country is changing very fast. And what Huntington says is that we need to stop calling ourselves an immigrant society. We're a settler society. And he tells us who we were settled by. We were settled by two groups, according to Huntington, Anglos and Saxons. Now somehow he skipped over native indigenous people. Uh, but not just Anglo-Saxons, uh, Anglo but also Christians. But not just Christians, not you Catholics. He says Protestant, English-speaking, hard-working people with a certain set of values and norms. And he goes on to say that anyone who comes later to the settler society more or less come as a guest. And you're only welcome here if you adhere to the rules and values and norms of the settlers. And he goes on to say that we are moving toward a potential ethnic or race war in the United States because we have all these newcomers coming who don't adhere to those norms and we should not be afraid to tell them they don't belong, that this is not their place. So that's Huntington's vision. He talks about this imaginary past when the country was controlled, uh, normalized, ruled by Anglo-Saxons. 
Now Jeff Chan looks at the same churning of people, of changing demographics, and he wrote a book, he's written a book called Who We Be. So Huntington is looking at this imaginary past, and Jeff Chan is looking at this apparent future. And he's saying, and he's written a more recent book saying, we're going to be all right. Uh, but he's also acknowledging that this creates tremendous turmoil. Uh, and that who we are is actually being developed, co-created, and contested. That we're not going to be the same country we were before we had large numbers of Irish, large numbers of Italians, large numbers of Eastern Europeans, and large numbers of Latinos, and large numbers of Muslims. That we're actually reconstituting who we are. We're making America. So the we in America for Jeff Chang is in the process of being made. For Huntington, it's the process of discovering who we are and sticking to that. Now this is a, a, a graph of a lot of work combined. But what this graph represents is that when countries go through large demographic change, it produces anxiety if that changes around some important axis. Uh, he did this work mainly in Europe, but then he brought it to the United States. And what he said is that when you have large demographic change, countries experience unconscious anxiety. And I explain this anxiety uh, more colloquially, if you will. So think about when you were five, or if you have a kid that's five, and you say, tomorrow you're going to school for the first day. That's a big change in a five-year-old's life. And we as humans have some difficulty processing too much change too fast. In fact, there's some assertion that if you get married, change your job, and move within a two-year period, your chances of having a heart attack goes up 50%. Now, presumably, the person you marry, you like. So it's like, it's not that the change is necessarily bad, it's just, it's too much. It's hard to process so much change in such a short period of time. And so when you take a five-year-old and say, your life is about to change, you create anxiety. It's like, really? You're going to go to a different place tomorrow. Now, how the child processed that change and how we all process this rapid change is through leadership, strategic narratives and structures. So there's a couple of ways of talking about this change. The two dominant ways is one, you tell the child, you're going to school tomorrow. There might be some big kids there. Some of them are going to be bullies. They're going to take your lunch money. So be careful. Don't talk to them. Now the kid is really anxious, and more than anxious, the kid is afraid. And it's like, I don't really want to go to school. Can I just stay home? Can I live in the past that I've lived up until the last five years? Can I retreat into a cocoon and stay, stop time? Uh, the other response a parent could give is, you're going to go to school tomorrow. There are going to be a lot of new kids. You're going to have a lot of play dates. You're going to learn to draw and learn your alphabet. Now the kid is, ooh, ooh, ooh. Do I have to wait till tomorrow? Can I go today? Uh, you've ex explained to the kid that something positive is about to happen. Their life is being upended, but not because of something negative, but something positive is about to happen. They don't want to stay in the cocoon. They're ready to become a butterfly. Let me out of the cocoon today. I'm ready. This one is called bri bridging, which is this one here, which is creating empathetic space and a new set of possibilities. The other one is called breaking. Breaking is about us and them, where we learn that the other is threatening. Breaking is a zero-sum or win-lose strategy. If the immigrants win, you lose. Uh, you worried about your job? Those immigrants did it. Uh, you worried about your housing price? 
Uh, those blacks did it. You're worried about you're not getting along with your husband or wife. Those gays did it when they destroyed the institution of marriage. It's someone else's fault. Your life anxiety, is, the story is given to you. It's not simply that people derive at this by themselves. They need help. Uh, the other one is, again, we're becoming more diverse. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to make new stuff. We're going to have new possibilities. This is a, a graph that actually shows how Americans respond to diversity. And it may be hard to read. Um, they, they're asking, are you bothered by the growing diversity in the country? And what you need to know is that the top line is the conscious response. So the majority of people say, no, it's a good thing. We like diversity. We're glad that University of Buffalo is increasing diversity. The bottom line is what the unconscious is doing. So while the conscious is saying, oh, diversity, yay, the unconscious is saying, can we build a wall? <laughs> can we slow this train down or can I get off of it? Uh, so there are two different responses and we have to understand, and this is not just conservatives and it's not just whites, that when we have a large change, there's anxiety. How that anxiety gets processed, how we understand it, what we do with it, is largely help design by stories, by structures, by situations. It doesn't go away by itself. This is uh, something that Susan Fiss developed, um, and it's called a the uh, um, the stereotype the stereotype content model. And what the one axis is how much you like someone. The second axis is how competent you think someone is. So when you really like someone and you think they're competent, you also think that's my posse. You know, yeah, Henry Tail, I like him and he's really smart. You know, so you, you feel warm toward him. You like him at a conscious and unconscious level. Now, there's some people you think are smart, but you don't particularly like them. You know, okay, they can do math or whatever, uh, but I don't really like them. They're not coming to my party. There's another group, we like them, but we don't think they're all that smart. And then the third or fourth group, we don't like them and we don't think they're smart. Now, we've, she's plotted out on a national level where different groups fall in these four axes. And it won't surprise you that the admire groups that we like and think are really smart tend to be white, tend to be white men, tend to be white men who are tall. Only 15% of American men are over six feet, but 60% of the CEOs who are men are over six feet. We like tall people. Uh, and this is largely at an unconscious level. Um, Asian Americans. We tend to think, yeah, okay, okay. They're smart. They can do math. They're good engineers. But we don't like them. Uh, we envy them, but we don't like them. Um, and then this group here, that's women. That's the elderly, that's the disabled. We like our Uncle Bill, we just don't want to work for him or work with him. We get him a line behind an elderly person and we switch lines. Uh, we don't think they're competent, but we like them well enough, we feel warm toward them. Women, yeah, we like them, we just don't think they can be a president. We don't think they're competent. Uh, and then this group, this is in some ways the most interesting group. The group we don't like and we don't think they're smart. And undocumented immigrants fall in that group, homeless people, uh, young black men. And when you're in this group, this is the most dangerous group to be in. Because nature thought it might be useful that when we see another human being, we recognize them. So there's a part of the brain that lights up when we see another human being. All it's saying is like, same species. Hey human, same species. That part of the brain does not light up for these people. 
So they're literally people that are unconscious level that we do not see as people. Uh, now you notice there's a lot of othering going on here. There's othering going on here, there's othering going on here, but at least we still see them as people. But for this group, we don't see them as people. And I've written an article saying you can't develop effective social policy for beings that you don't consider people. Uh, and I think it explains a lot of what's going on in America that there are a lot of people who are not really seen as belonging, who are not seen as real people. They're a threat to us. And those beings need to be walled off, either in prisons or at a border. They need to be controlled. Uh, they need to be supervised. We can't really trust them. And you can see this is just the change that's going on in America. America's changing very fast. And it's not just America, it's also Europe. It's also Africa. It's also Latin America. And so that's why the issue of how we deal with the sort of change, this anxiety that you will feel worldwide is the problem of the 21st century. The world has become small and is becoming smaller still. And it's not all demographics, there's also technological change. And even though we like our iPhone, uh, it still creates anxiety. It creates, it disrupts our lives in some way. So even when we like our new partner that we're about to marry, it's like, okay, you know, I guess it's all right that you're living with me now. Uh, <laughs> I was fine before, but all right. <laughs> um, we all live in structures, but we don't live in the same structure or we don't have the same relationship to structures. Uh, and these structures are connected. So when you buy a house, you're also buying a school district. You're also buying a playground. You're also buying clean air. You're also buying, so a house, the built environment, is a deeply interconnected set of structures. And they're unevenly distributed. So we need to understand our relationship to structures uh, and the work that structures are doing. We tend to not only be, we have a hard time seeing structures. We, we sort of think of a structure as neutral, but they're not. Structures are constantly distributing resources. And at a deep level, structure is even distributing identity. So some of you know that I've done work around opportunity structures. And, I've, and what we've done is map out how structures are organized to create opportunity, but unevenly. It creates it for some groups and retarded for others. Sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's unconscious. So where you live matters. Your zip code matters. And indeed, it matters a lot. So these are some death records that we looked at. Um, and I have a video, so hopefully I can get help to play it in a little bit. Uh, but what these death records show is that where you live affects how long you live, independently of your individual actions. So the next time you're buying a house and you're talking to the realtor, you should say, how long do people in the zip code live? <laughs> uh, and again, it won't surprise you that when we do this, we find that where black people live, where Latinos live, uh, where groups that don't belong live, independently of their individual behavior and independently of their own socioeconomic status. That is, it's not simply income. That the neighborhood is doing some work independently of personal behavior and income. It's affecting their lives. Uh, and we can actually plot this. Uh, and if I have time, I'll go into it in a little more detail. So, again, neighborhoods do all kinds of work. I was asked to look at a project in Minnesota for the Hmong population. The city of um, Minneapolis was going to help them buy property and they wanted me to advise the community. And so I looked at the data and looked at uh, projections and I said to the Hmong community, you can buy that property 
and you have a place to live, but you're not going to build any wealth. Because where they're consigning you to live is a low growth place in a high growth environment. Everybody around you is going to be making money and all you're going to be getting is shelter. And the people say, why would we do that? I said, I don't know, there's a lot of reasons you might do it. I'm just telling you. Uh, and the city said, we didn't tell you to tell them not to take the property. <laughs> I said, no, you told me to tell them, to advise them what the trends show. So we can actually look at, and when you look at high wealth areas, those are areas that people tend to live longer. Even low income people in those high wealth areas live longer than low income people in low wealth areas. And some data suggests that low income people in high wealth areas live longer than middle class people in low wealth areas. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, because uh, the stress of living in areas where there are police shootings, even if you're never shot, the stress of living in places where there's bad air, the stress of living in places where there are no parks uh, and there's no public transportation has an effect on everyone living in that area. And what this data shows is uh, this line really shows uh, inequality in health problems. So basically what it's showing is that the more inequality there is, the worse the health outcomes for everyone including the people who are wealthy. So tremendous inequality depresses the life chances of everybody living in a high unequal society. And you can see Japan's doing pretty well and the United States is up there all by itself. <laughs> Not a healthy place to live. So you might want to take a trip to the Peace Bridge. <laughs> So this is uh, the video I want to show you. Soft cloud. This is a video by a friend of mine, uh, David Williams at Harvard. Um, Stay connected. The Microsoft Cloud offers infinite. Be honestly concerned about is with this current election, the levels of incivility that have been created, the, the tendency to quickly insult others who, who disagree with us or, or who uh, belong to a different political party, it, it is creating a hostile environment. And there's other scientific evidence that indicates it's not just the, the actual experiences of discrimination directed towards you that affects your health, but the extent to which there's that hostility in the large environment that also has adverse impacts on health. So that creating a more civil discourse, we can disagree and not be disagreeable. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't necessarily have to follow the, the bad examples of some of our political leadership in terms of speaking to others with respect and treating mm -hmm. everyone with dignity. These things literally are affecting the physical and mental health of others. Are you essentially, not to oversimplify this, but are you essentially saying that the incivility that we're experiencing today, the feelings of angst, are, is shortening our lifespan? Yes, it could well be. And we have a good example of that. In the wake of September 11th in the United States, there was an increased harassment and discrimination of Arab Americans in the United States. And a study was done that looked at Arab American women um, giving birth in the six months before September 11th and the six months after. The six months after was when there was all the discrimination and hostility. And what it found was that for Arab American women only, those who give birth after September 11th, um, had were more likely to give birth to low birth weight infants and infants who were born prematurely. Mm -hmm. So it was affecting not only the health of the mothers, but actually the health of the next generation. Yes, because then it's going to have ongoing exactly. continuing. Exactly. <laughs> that kind of leads to another area of research that you're an expert at. I just, you use the term weathering. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we have a growing body of research 
that shows not only that African Americans and other disadvantaged minority populations in the United States live shorter lives and get sick at younger ages um, and their diseases tend to be more severe. All of those things are true. But in addition to that, we now have scientific researchers documenting that because of all of the stressors we face in our home environments, in our work environments, in our neighborhood environments, that all of these stressors are literally leading us to age biologically physiologically more rapidly than whites. I'll give you two examples of research. One is a national study that showed that if you look at the levels of physiological functioning that whites had on average at age uh, 55 to 64. And what do you mean by that? We are looking at their levels of cholesterol. We are looking at their blood pressure levels. We are looking at their, their levels of inflammation. But we, I mean, what I'm saying it though is that's important. I'm not talking about how they said they feel. We are looking at physiologically, biologically, we're doing blood tests and looking at where these folks are mm -hmm. biologically. The level of biological functioning and our biological function declines as we age that whites have in their mid-60s, African-Americans have it 10 years earlier. So that, so that although African-Americans are chronologically 10 years older, biologically they're the same age as whites, 10 years older than they are. Uh, another study, just to give another example, use uh, telomere length. Telomere length is something that scientists are very fascinated with. It's looking at the level of the cells of your body and the shorter your telomeres, um, it's the, the it, it, it captures how aged you are biologically. Your cells, looking at your individual yes, cells. Yes, looking at the level of the, yes, the cells of your body. And what it found, black and white women are the same chronological age. African American females are seven and a half years older biologically than their white counterparts who are the same chronological age. I don't as like they are. that stat. It, it as is, a black is, woman, that's I know, you're troubling is, me here. It is it is not a good stat. What what it does say to us as a nation is that the racial disparities in health, which we have talked about, which we've documented for a hundred years, this is not new, that these things are consequential because they are leading to the loss of life prematurely mm -hmm. in the most productive years of life. Mm -hmm. And that is hurting us as individuals, but it's also hurting us as a nation. Uh, whatever diminishes one of us hurts our economic productivity as a country. It hurts our global competitiveness. So, um, kind of gloomy. Uh, but anyway, so what David is talking about, and, and, and uh, I have a colleague who works at the Haas Institute who actually looks at there's something called allostatic load, which is looking at about 10 or 12 different stress markers that are environmental. And the allostatic load for different communities are different. Again, not individual behavior. Uh, and the higher the allostatic load, the shorter your lifespan, the more stress, the more likely you are to have um, uh, chronic health problems, and it's profoundly racialized. And so I'm actually trying to get researchers now to sort of look at a, um, a baseline for allostatic loads for different communities, and then come up with a way of reducing the difference between allostatic load or getting it down to an acceptable level. Again, the physical environment, the built environment, the cultural environment all affect not only how well we live, but how long we live. Uh, and so, so when people talk about, well, so what is racism? Uh, as an abstract thing, we may have some uh, difficulty defining it, but we're getting to the point now where we can define it physiologically that there's an impact of constantly dealing with racial stress or with other stress, with not belonging on one's physical health and well-being. Um, so we all have blind spots, um, literally and figuratively, um, and we tend to have the same blind spots as people who are like us. Uh, so one of the important things, potentially, about diversity is we can compensate for 
each other's blind spot. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things about being what people call privileged or being normalized is you're more likely to belong. Uh, think about it. When, when, when I go to the bathroom, I don't have to think. It's not, it's not a stressful situation unless I wait too long. Uh, and someone's already in the bathroom, then it can become very stressful. But generally speaking, it's not stressful. I go to the bathroom, go. But if you can't go to the bathroom because of the way we structure bathrooms, uh, it's a problem. Now here's an interesting footnote. Now many of you think I'm talking about transgender bathroom, right? How many thought I was talking about transgender bathroom? Raise your hand. Come on now. All right, all right. That's a possibility. But here's another example where it comes up. At a football game, women experience tremendous stress when they have to go to the bathroom because of the way we structure bathrooms. Uh, and in California, we're starting to deal with that. Literally, when women go to the bathroom, men running in and out with urinals, and women standing in those long lines. And they didn't want to go to the football game in the first place. <laughs> uh, it's actually quite stressful. Uh, so California is actually changing the law around the construction of bathrooms. Who would have thought that bathrooms at a football stadium were gendered? They are. Structures carry certain values. They work better for some groups than for other groups. Not because the guy who designed the bathroom thought, I'm going to punish my wife. You know, I really don't want her to go to the game with me, so I'm going to make it really uncomfortable for her. Uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, but we have to look and see what structures are actually doing. Um, and we have to redesign structures. So, you know, you just look at this structure. You don't have to know much about it. But I can say that most of you would not want to live there. There's something about it that's off-putting. There's something about the structure itself that's stigmatizing. Kenneth Clark wrote a book called Dark Ghettos talking about the very physical structure of ghettos was stigmatizing to blacks. Uh, and again, as designers, you can think about that. Now, structures are never one single thing. So it's not the housing, it's not the transportation, it's not the park. It's all those things interacting that create structures. Uh, and so when we actually begin to design structures and think about structures, we need to think about these things in relationship to each other. Which makes it a little bit complicated because we're already busy and now I'm saying in addition to think about housing, I want you to think about water. I want you to also think about food. I want you to also think about uh, the police. I also want you so it's, it's hard to sort of wrap your head around all those things. But there's a solution in a sense in terms of not only looking at these things in relationship to each other, but seeing if there's a couple of leverage points. If there's some things you can do that actually began to impact the other things that you don't do. Because these things are related, sometimes doing one or two things can have a positive impact on several things. When we talk about structures, oftentimes we actually talk about removing barriers. Certainly that's important. But I want to push us beyond moving barriers and sort of to affirmatively think about designing structures to produce the outcome we want. So affirmatively structuring different environments to produce the outcome we want for different populations. Uh, so something may produce a positive outcome for one population, but not a positive outcome for another population. So I want to talk just for a few minutes about implicit bias. But let me just give a show of hands. How many people know what implicit bias is? A show of hands. <laughs> implicit bias. OK. Implicit just means not fully conscious. So it means unconscious bias. Actually, I don't like the word implicit, the term implicit bias, but that's the term that, that we have. Uh, because we don't like, we're biased against bias. We think only bad people have bias. The reality is we all have bias. It's the way the nature of the mind works. The mind is deeply habituated. Uh, and we, could, we cannot live without bias. The exact content of the bias is social. The fact that we have bias is biological. The fact that 
Uh, but what the bias is, and the strength of the bias, is given to us by society. Uh, so bias does a number, implicit bias does a lot of things. It sorts things in the category, it creates associations between things, and it fills in the gaps. Um, <coughs> the unconscious mind is very fast. The conscious mind is very slow. The conscious mind, in one second, processes about 40 bits of information. Four zero. In that same second, the unconscious mind processes about 11 million bits of information. So all the work's actually being done at unconscious level, not the conscious level. And it's happening so fast that we can't control the unconscious. In fact, uh, it controls us. If you want to know how someone's going to react or behave, it's almost irrelevant to ask what their conscious thinks. You really want to find out what the unconscious thinks. And the process of othering can happen, and usually does happen, at an unconscious level. So we're talking about habits of the mind. Uh, we're processing so much information that we have to do most of it at an unconscious level. Um, so, when I talk about unconscious mind, implicit bias, it sounds a little wonky. People sometimes think, well, you know, it may be true that my partner doesn't know what's going on unconsciously, but I do. Uh, but this is just the structure of the mind. And um, so I want to give you just a brief demonstration of this. And what I'm going to do is um, show you some colors. And what I want you to do when I see the colors, I want you to say out loud together what the color is. Now, if there are any letters or words, which there will be, I want you to ignore the letters or words. We're not interested in the letters or words. We're only interested in the color. Is that clear? Think you could do that? All right, we'll see. All right, so we're going to go at a good clip. Uh, so it'll only take a couple of minutes. And you're not to think about this, you're just to say the word, the color, as, as quickly as you can with a little oomph. All right? Here we go. <laughs> Um, okay, that didn't go as it was planned. <laughs> and let me tell you why it didn't and what, and, and I'll give you the PowerPoint, you can play with it yourself. But basically, what happens is that uh, the color got bleached out for some reason. But w when people see the color red and the word blue, they, they hesitate. The unconscious is reading. Even though I ask you not to read, you can't help but read. You can't turn the unconscious off. Uh, and so you actually get what people call cognitive depletion. When your conscious and unconscious don't agree on something, it takes more energy. And you get tired quicker. Um, and so this, this is the basic way of introducing you to the unconscious. Um, what we do with this is we actually have associations and then we have images of people. And it turns out that we have unconscious associations with people. So I want you to look at this and tell me what you see. What you see? Okay, let's do it again. All right. Now here's it. Now here's it a little, a little slower. You see anything that time? Yeah. What'd you see that time? Okay, so the first one was a white person, the second was a black person. Now this test has been done several times, and what it is, you can speed up the, uh, the, um, the imagery so you can't see it consciously. Here's the thing, you can see it unconsciously. Remember I told you the unconscious is very fast, the conscious is very slow. So this is called subliminal. So we can see things unconsciously that, we, that don't register consciously. Why is that important? What they've been able to do with this is they, um, they then show a degraded object that you can't make out 
what the object is. And the test is, as quickly as you can, identify the object. And the object, the degraded object, is a gun. And what they found is that when they subliminally show people a picture of a black face, their ability to identify the gun speeds up. Uh, you may say, why is that? The reason is because in our society, we have an implicit association with black faces, particularly black men, and guns. Now some of you researchers are going to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Black men don't have more guns than white men. The unconscious is not a researcher. Uh, it makes these associations because of frequency and proximity. So if it's seeing things over and over again, you heard of Pavlov's dog? Uh, so you ring the bell, you feed the dog. You ring the bell, you feed the dog. You ring the bell, the dog starts salivating. There's no relationship between the dog and the bell. But the unconscious mind draws an association, and so when it hears the bell, it starts salivating. That's what we're like. So if we see a lot of pictures and images from our culture that associate black men with guns and violence, whether it's true or not is irrelevant. The unconscious makes that association. So even when we can't see the face consciously, it affects our ability to actually identify the gun. Um, now think about that. You're a policeman, and you're walking down the street and there's a black man. You already have in your mind, at an unconscious level, not because you are necessarily a racist, or that you don't like black people. This is what we've done in our society. We've created this association that then people inhabit and carry with them. And the association is so profound that it's not just in white police, it's also in black police. The association is stronger, tends to be stronger in white police than black police because blacks are likely to have some counter stereotypical example. That is, they're going to know some black person that doesn't carry a gun. Whereas you're, if you're white living in a segregated society, and the only time you see black people on television, they all have guns. They're all dangerous. And so Trump could really believe that the black community is out of order and everybody's shooting everybody. It's like, well, where'd you get that from? Television. Clearly he didn't get it from hanging out with black people. <laughs> So structures carry values and communicate values. And, and the charge I'm suggesting for you is to begin to know what those values are. Begin to know if those values are sending out a message you belong or you other. Now I've talked a lot about race, but othering can happen across any number of categories, and it does. It can happen across the category of age, just a height, or, uh, or religion, or accent. Now, none of those things by themselves carry any meaning. So the fact that someone is black is morally irrelevant until we put a social relevance on it. And we do. Even though we, act to, we like to pretend like we don't. We like to pretend that we don't even notice race. The unconscious notices race very fast. It notices it faster than it notices gender uh, in our society. Not in every society, in our society. Um, so these associations are called schemas, and these schemas produce outcomes. So it calls upon us to actually create new schemas. I've made reference to this already. Uh, and I'm suggesting that we are not just trying to remove barriers, we're trying to design structures that are inclusive. We're trying to design structures that carry the message and the values that you belong. Uh, so um, I work with Apple and some other uh, fruit companies in the Bay Area. Um, when you go to a tech company, the pictures on the wall if they're all of Star Trek and space movies, you're actually sending a message to women that they don't belong. And it affects their blood pressure, it affects their heart rate, it affects their, uh, their skin resistance, and it affects their performance. Again, no one's saying anything, but the physical environment sends a message. 
So how do we think about restructuring structures to make them inclusive? Well, one of the things I advocate is something called targeted universalism. Uh, and what targeted universalism suggests is that because structures carry with it certain values, we want to figure out what the value is. We build an escalator. The purpose of the escalator is not neutral, right? We don't build an escalator to be neutral. We build an, an escalator to perform a certain task, to take people from one floor to the next floor. But now here comes someone in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. We are more likely in this situation to notice the person in the wheelchair and not notice the structure. In fact, we say the structure is neutral, but the person in the wheelchair has special needs. It's the person in the wheelchair that needs to be fixed, not the structure. So we need to flip that and think about what is the structure doing and not doing and for whom. When it's doing something for the dominant group, uh, it looks like it's neutral. Um, so here you have some people looking over a fence. Now notice that they're all the same height and they have a different needs to look over the fence because of the structure that they're using. So one person is on a mound, one person is on a medium-sized stool, and one person is on a, a long stool. Um, this is another rendition of the same thing. But notice this time, it's not the... This time, they're of a different height. If you give everybody the same stool, the person who's short can't look over the, the fence. Um, so this is equality. I'm going to treat everybody the same. No. People have different needs based on their relationship to structures. An es escalator will not help me if I'm in a wheelchair. Um, and so this would be equity, right? We want everyone to look over the fence. So one person can just stand and look over the fence. One person needs one box. Another person needs two boxes. This is reality. The person that's tall gets all the boxes. The person that's short, who needs the boxes, get a hole. <laughs> now some people would say, let's just get rid of fen the fence altogether. Let's not deal with structures. And oftentimes when people say, we're all just individuals. That's a variation of that. The reality is we can't live without structures. We have to have structures. But we have to make structures work for us. And so when we design structures to work for us, we need to think about what we want to do, what's the universal goal, get everyone to the third floor. How do you then design it for different populations? So the goal is universal. The strategy is targeted based on how we're situated. The goal is universal. We want all kids to learn to read and, and be proficient and good citizens. That's the goal. The strategy will be different. Different kids will need different things. Not because there's something wrong with the kids, but because they're situated differently. So we want structures to actually work to get everyone to the universal goal. We're not just concerned with the kids who are not performing well. We're concerned with all kids. But they need different things to get to that universal goal. This is a subtle shift, but it's an important shift. Uh, now sometimes when we talk about equity, we talk about just closing the gap. Targeted universalism has a slightly different frame. It's saying we need to move to that universal goal. What's the universal goal? Is it what white people have? No. We should state explicitly what the universal goal is. And then we can measure different populations in relationship to that universal goal and come up with strategies which are different for those populations to get to that goal. Um, so I'm going to go uh, through these last couple of slides very fast because I want to have some time
to possibly have an interaction. <coughs> Again, target universalism is a strategy for all. It's not just the most vulnerable. Uh, and to some extent, you're not fixing the people. You're fixing the structures themselves to actually work for the people, which most of the time we don't do. We actually say, okay, you know, I've done a lot of work with the, the initiative around black men and boys, and we say, okay, let's put a tie on them, have them wear a coat, pull their pants up. I'm not against any of that. Although I'm not crazy about ties, uh, but we don't look at the structure. We don't look at the culture. We say the, all the adaptation has to take place in the community or the individual. So target universalism is not simply uh, putting people, it's certainly not excluding people, uh, and it's certainly not saying people come into a structure and the structure stay the same. When people come into the structure, they actually change the structure, they contribute to the structure. Uh, the structure itself is part of the discourse, not simply access to the structure. Henry and I were talking about this earlier. We're trying to get to a place where people belong. This is a South African word, uh, uh, and it's a great word. And basically it means, I see you. And the response is this, and I can't really say it, it means, I am here. And when they say, I see you, it doesn't mean I just see you. It's like, I see you, I see your ancestors, I see those, I see, I really see you. We notice people, but oftentimes we don't see people if they're not, if they don't belong, if we feel like they don't belong. So our goal then is to create an environment where everyone belongs. And belonging is the primary and most important gift that we give to each other or that we withhold. Uh, when people don't belong, they don't live as long, they don't feel as good, they're stressed out. Uh, we notice them, but we don't see them. Uh, and we want to sh we want to sh shift that. And we shift it in part by bridging stories. We bridge stories by hearing each other's suffering and hearing each other's feelings. To suffer with and to feel with is what compassion means. So it means having compassion for each other. Oftentimes we want people to hear our story, but we're actually not that interested in their story. Uh, or we get into a competition of stories. We well, think, you got it bad. Let me tell you what happened to me. Uh, Instead, we want a place where people's stories collectively come together and build a bigger story and build a future, an aspiration that is shared. Uh, and we also want shared structures, whether we call it public space or whether we call it schools. How do we actually bring people together and have them create empathetic bridges? Um, so this is how you do some of this. And we recognize we're in constantly in relationship with each other. We affect each other. And this is just somehow, some of the ways you would do it. Um, pay attention to how we're situated. Pay attention to our, to our connectedness. Uh, Pay attention to the process itself. Is it an inclusive process? Um, make it multifaceted. And this is not just a mechanical thing. This is a profoundly spiritual journey. We're talking about uh, creating space for the soul to breathe. So we're not just talking about building a, a, a nice building. And those of you who are designers and architects, you know when you build a nice building, People relax. You know, people walk into the building, it's like, I feel good in here. We did a study in a school district. I won't mention the school district, but the black and Latino kids were not going into the AP classes. And the narrative was they were ill prepared and the classes were too hard. And we knew that wasn't true just by looking at the test scores. And when we went and talked to the, the students, what they said is they walk into a classroom. They didn't see anybody that looked like them. They didn't see their posse. And they said, this is not my place. 
not because the work was so hard, but because they didn't see themselves and they didn't feel like they were going to be seen. And so it's like, I'd rather go take a general math class rather than a calculus <coughs> class uh, than to be with people who constantly remind me that I don't belong. Um, and there's much more of this in a book called Racing to Justice, written by a really wonderful scholar. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop now and, and I think we maybe have a little time for question and answers. So anybody got a question? Oh, Michaela. Hi, Dana. Um, you mentioned um, hearing each other's stories and having empathy for each other. And you mentioned a lot about how the mind is sort of like the first place for a process of understanding to start. And I'm wondering, in your personal experience, um, how do you force yourself to hear stories that you don't want to hear? Um, so the question for those in the back was, how do, how do I force myself to hear stories I don't want to hear? Um, so, there, this is a complicated question, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's sort of a, a cyclical thing. We, we are more likely to hear stories from people that we like, no matter what the story is. Um, and so, we're in a public setting, we're in a university. It's a wonderful place for people to hear each other's stories. When we talk about the arts, um, one of my favorite writers is James Baldwin. And there's a, a lot of wonderful stories about James Baldwin, but one of them, white people didn't really want to listen to James Baldwin. But they did. And there was one period in his life where they basically said, okay, he actually has a new movie I call I'm Not Your Negro. Uh, but they said, this Negro can write. Okay, we didn't, I hate to admit it, but this Negro can write. Uh, and so they said, all right, begrudgingly, we will hear your story because, you know, you're just so good. But, um, and so we're going to ask you to come into the literary society that's basically all white, predominantly men. <laughs> We don't, want to, we don't want you to bring your black friends with you. <laughs> and we're not going to say anything about you being gay. So if you're willing to leave that stuff at the door, you can come in. And James Baldwin said, no, thank you. And he said he wrote another book called The Price of the Ticket. Uh, and he said the price of the ticket for belonging was too great. That what was being asked of me was to give up who I am so that I could associate with the white elites. Um, I think that uh, we are in relationship with each other and even when we don't want to hear each other's stories we actually make up stories about each other uh, um, Toni Morrison has written a book and she talks about how obsessed white America is about black America but in a weird way <laughs> And the work around the mind conscious work shows that. So white America, this, this, this is descriptive. This is not normative. I'm not claiming that this is good or bad. I'm just saying the mind science says white America is obsessed with black America. The unconscious is thinking about it all the time. So when white, white people say, I don't know any black people. I don't think about race because I live in an all white community. I say, go take an unconscious test and then come back and talk to me. Uh, but the story that they tell about black America is a scary story. They tell breaking stories. They tell, like the story Donald Trump tells about Mexicans. It's like, they're gonna come here and take your job and kill your women and rape you and, you know, it's like, really? How many Mexicans do you know? None, <laughs> but, but still, it's true. Uh, so part of it is that, uh, in a sense, this also brings in culture, it also brings in environment. Um, can we tell a story and we are more easily listen to a story that don't threaten us. In other words, if I, tell, if I tell a story that I win and you lose, that's a story that's hard for me to hear. Also, I'm more willing to listen to most stories if I know that if I listen to you for two minutes, you're going to listen to me for two minutes. But I'm not inclined to listen to you for two minutes or five minutes is at the end of it, you don't want to hear from me. 
And that's the way we do race in this country. We actually don't talk to each other. We accuse each other. Uh, and uh, we create a lot of conditions, like with James Baldwin. I'll talk to you, provided you leave all your stuff at the door. Uh, so part of it is just to create the environment. And I think people want to talk to each other. I think we are related to each other. Uh, but actually, can we lower the temperature just a little bit? I'm not saying get it cold, because there's some stuff we have to deal with, but just a little bit. Um, and, um, and then see what happens. And there's just a lot of data out that when people are together in a structured way, in a way that's not overly threatened, uh, that people actually want to hear each other's story. There's something called mirror neurons. Uh, so look it up when you go home. It, it apparently, in the way they discovered mirror, mirror neurons, is with monkeys. There was a monkey in a, a lab, and the, uh, they had him hooked up to, uh, uh, to all kind of brain stuff, and the guy, the researcher, starts eating. I think he was eating the banana or nuts, and the monkey's brain was mimicking like it was eating. It's like, the monkey's not eating, why is that going off? Uh, and so, again, nature has actually created a space where we are inclined to actually reach toward each other. Uh, and so, to some extent, the fact that we don't means that there's a lot of work being done to keep us apart. Uh, one last story on this, which is sort of interesting. At the height of the Civil Rights Movement, the segregationists were really concerned, and they said, black children and white children should not go to school together. Why? segregationists, because if they go to school together, they will marry each other. And some of those people who marry will even have sex with each other. <laughs> and the civil rights advocate said, this is not about marriage or sex. This is about education. Uh, and the segregationists said, if black and children go to school together, they will have sex together, and it will destroy the white race all kind of bad things will happen. And the civil rights community said, this is not about sex. <laughs> Both of them were wrong. Uh, it certainly was about sex, but it didn't destroy the white race, or maybe it changed the white race as we know it. Uh, but what I'm saying is that when you put people in close proximity under certain conditions, and this is Alpert's work, I've written a book called The Nature of Prejudice, things happen. Uh, and the thing is that we don't spatially put people together. You look at some of the greatest relationship and friendships between the black and white community, and they happen in the army. Think about that. You take an 18-year-old from rural Alabama, and a black kid from Detroit, and a Latino from uh, LA, 18 years old, you put them in a foxhole together and give them all guns. <laughs> and they, come, and they, they don't come out killing each other, they come out friends because they've had some contact together under a certain condition. But we don't have that condition in our civil life. The whites live in here, the blacks live over here, Latinos live over here, and we see each other through social media. So I think that you know, there's reason to be more hopeful if we can actually create space where we actually can have real contact with each other. Well, Professor Powell, first and foremost, thank you for coming to see you today. My question goes to structures. Most easily seen in affordable housing. There's a known structure. The structure segregates and keeps people off the streets, etc. Et if you have a development that is passable, the individuals living there, at least I find in, in what I do every day, are nervous of any change of that structure because of discrimination, because what they've been promised has never come to fruition. So they know there's a problem, there's, there's a known problem, but the individuals who are the ones who engage in the conversation about how to change that structure are often, I find, are often unwilling to engage in that conversation because of fear that their voices will not be heard. I was wondering if you could address uh, that. Thank you. Thank you. So affordable housing is actually quite important. I, I've written a piece called Opportunity-Based Housing, which I would um, uh, recommend to you. Uh, I think housing should not only should be affordable, but it actually should link people to a whole set of opportunities. Uh, and ultimately, people should have input into how we structure those opportunities. 
so people aren't passively being given something. Uh, the whole idea of a democracy is that we get to shape the society we live in. Um, and a lot of things are sort of, um, I talk about a feedback loop. I taught at the University of Minnesota. Shannon is here, one of my former students who's now on the faculty here. Uh, and I asked students, and, and, and University of Minnesota is relatively liberal, I asked students, how many, have had, how many had the experience or know the experience of black families moving in <coughs> to your neighborhood, your parents' neighborhood, and then the value of housing going down? And the students are kind of, you know, it's like, that sounds racist. I don't want to raise my hand. I said, come on, come on. Everybody had, right? Because it happens. But it doesn't happen because black people move in. It happens because white people move out. So we conf you're conf confusing the cause, right? So it's like, I don't want black people to move in because when black people move in, bad stuff happens. No, black stuff, in terms of the value of housing, if you affect the demand by taking 70, 80% of the population away from the demand cycle, the value of housing goes down. Uh, so how could you actually, so then, to your point, if you say, I want to build affordable housing here, some people are going to say, if those people move in, the value of my asset is going to be, is going to decline. <coughs> and it's one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. So how could we actually deal with that fear and still have people move in? Um, and we've done it in a number of places. Um, again, it's not perfect, but you say, first of all, you don't build all the housing in one place. Uh, there's a certain distribution. Secondly, you make it harder for people to move out. Uh, and you talk about these fears. You have to get them on the, on the table. One of the things about anxiety, and Trump got this right, and I wrote about this before the election. I said, Trump got this right, and my friend said, you can't write that in a newspaper. <laughs> I said, but he, he actually talked to people about their fears and their anxieties. Now, he didn't talk. The message he gave, from my perspective, was the wrong message, but he at least acknowledged it. Whereas most people, it's like, I don't want to acknowledge that you're afraid of the black person next to you, or the Latino person next to you, or the, the gay person next to you. Well, the fear doesn't go away. It just stays there and festers. And then someone comes along and says, it's okay for you to be afraid. Someone else could come along and say, it's okay for you to be afraid, nothing bad is going to happen. But first, I have to acknowledge your fear. So when people have fear, my approach would be, get it on the table. Let's talk about it. It doesn't make you a bad person to have fear. It doesn't make you a bad person to have anxiety. It makes you human. Um, just a very quick story. Someone came to my office who uh, worked for the Washington Post, uh, and, and he was uh, paraplegic. And I've been doing this work for a long time, the mind science work and all this stuff. This guy came to my office, his, someone willed him in. He spoke through a voice box, so I couldn't really understand him. Literally, I could feel myself getting tense. I could feel myself sweating. I was like, how long is this interview? I couldn't really understand the guy. Uh, you know, when he talked, it was like, and, and I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. And I'm uncomfortable that I'm uncomfortable. Because I know I'm not supposed to be uncomfortable. I'm not even supposed to notice that he's a paraplegic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I was aware enough, and the interview lasted almost two hours. By the end of the interview, I was much more comfortable. We were joking. Uh, when he first walked in my office, see there? <laughs> he didn't walk in my office. Did you get that? <laughs> when he first came into my office, what I did was, and then I felt like a fool, because he didn't have hands. So my hand is just hanging out there. It's like, okay, I screwed up. You know, uh, and so, but instead of just processing it, part of my discomfort was directed at him. He was the problem. Uh, and so, part of the thing in terms of when we get in these groups, we do have a lot of discomfort. But can we create space where the discomfort itself becomes part of the discussion? Uh, where we can talk about what it's like if this is the first time you've been around uh, Muslims, it's the first time you've been around gays, it's the first time you've been around straight people. Whatever it is, can we have that conversation to put that on the table without privileging one position over the other? 
Uh, so I don't think fear itself is the problem. I think the problem is when we're afraid to talk about the fear. I don't think the anxiety itself is a problem. I think the problem is when we're afraid to talk about the anxiety. There's a question in the front, so I'm going to move this up. Okay. <coughs> Dr. Powell, there was a recent story on NPR that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. It was just um, related to, to food work that we do. Um, the story was uh, about stress, choice, and equity. Um, and it had to do with uh, some kind of scientific experiment they had done with two individuals or, or a group of individuals where they gave one set a whole series of numbers and then they gave the second set four or five numbers. And they said, okay, you remember this number. You walk down that hall, and when you get to the end of the hall, you're going to repeat your number. So each set sat there and remembered their numbers, and then they were instructed to go down the hall. In the hallway, they were intercepted by an individual who made them an offer. They said, "Would you know, for participating in this study, we'd like to give you uh, a treat, a snack. You can have a piece of cake or you can have a salad. And overwhelmingly, the individuals that had to hold the long list of numbers would choose the cake. Um, and then the individuals who only had four or five numbers would choose the salad. And I left that, um, as we do talk a lot about choice in terms of being healthy or um, and it, so something when you, what you were speaking about earlier triggered that story, and I was wondering if you could address that a little bit. So. Sure. So I don't know, the people in the back here? Okay, great. Um, complicated question in some respects. Um, just to give you a little background, choice is largely a myth. In fact, they actually could even show that almost every choice we make at a conscious level, the con unconscious has already made a choice, and it gives it to the conscious. And then we, the conscious appropriates it. Uh, and so, and, it, and so the unconscious is doing stuff. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost spooky how fast and big and important the unconscious is. Uh, and so probably what's happening in there, and I've looked at some similar studies, is you're rewarding yourself. You're stressed out, I want a sweet. You know, why am I stressed out? Because I'm trying to remember 10 numbers, and the reason that in the United States, not the same in some other countries. Uh, the reason that phone numbers were seven digits is because that's how many digits we could remember. And then they say, and the area codes. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Forget the area code. Uh, now, we don't have to do that anymore because we all have it on our phone and we don't remember any numbers. Uh, which is one reason that actually cell phones actually are popular. They relieve stress. So what the mind is trying to do is, is looking for shortcuts. Is there something I can do that actually relieves all of this pressure? And when we relieve the pressure, endorphins are released. We feel better. So in a sense, a person is medicating. It's like, oh, chocolate cake, I feel better already. You know, uh, it doesn't matter that I'm not going to feel better tomorrow uh, once I, this chocolate cake hits my stomach. Um, so that's probably what's happening, is that the person is self-medicating, uh, trying to deal with stress. Now let me just say one other thing about stress. You didn't ask this, but I'll answer it anyway, because I know you were thinking about this. Uh, stress itself is not the problem. We can't live life without stress. The problem is the lack of de-stress. The lack of de-stress. So when you go to communities that are stressed out, it means they don't have appropriate de-stressors. It means, so literally, if you go like this, and you can try it at home, see how long you can squeeze your hand together. Most people can't do it for 90 seconds before the hands start cramping. But if you go like this, you can do that forever. Uh, and so what happens to certain communities is that they don't have any de-stressors. And then people look for de-stressors. And oftentimes, the distresses we look for are actually hidden stressors. Cigarettes. I need a cigarette because I'm feeling tense. Well, a cigarette is a hidden stressor. It doesn't actually relax you. I need a drink. Watching television. 
Watching television is a hidden de-stressor. It actually doesn't relax the body. It distracts you, but it doesn't really relax you. Uh, so what we, and, and it sounds hokey, right? I mean, they've shown that for young kids and, and stressed communities, black kids, if they take and teach them meditation, breathing, yoga, the first reaction is always, I don't want to do that because it's a white thing. We don't, do, we don't do yoga in the black community. Uh, well, the black community is very diverse. But we need to have, I don't care what the distressor is, we need to have some collective way of distressing. So one of the things about a built environment is there natural distressors. I walk outside and I see a beautiful green space. And I get on my bike. Without thinking about it, I'm distressing. There's another community, you walk outside and there's a highway next to you and garbage every place. That's actually exas exacerbating the stressors. Uh, so if we don't have stressors and de-stressors naturally in the environment, we will actually artificially try to get some. And the ones that we are most likely to pick are actually are not going to be real de-stressors. And choice actually says almost nothing about that. I'll tell you one last thing on this, and I don't know if we have time for maybe one more question. I've done a lot of work on terms of obesity. Uh, obesity is one of those interesting things. It actually means something different in different communities. Um, but obesity is not a personal issue. Uh, I work with the Robin Wood Johnson Foundation. They asked me to come and look at some of the stuff around obesity. Uh, I looked at the data. It's something like this. In 1970, there was not one state in the country where more than 20% of the population was obese. By 2000, there was not one state in the country uh, that had less than 20% of the population obese. I'm saying, whoa, 20 or 30 years, everybody got obese? That can't be explained in terms of personal behavior. And yet, Robin Wood Johnson's, all the intervention was to tell the person not to eat that cake. Uh, and then you sort of blame the person. Well, we told them not to eat the cake, they ate it anyway. So I started looking for, is there something in the structure? Did something happen to, uh, that all of a sudden 300 million Americans changed their behavior and got fat? And the answer is yes. It was the food. That if you look at the food processing, the food processing in the country changed dra dramatically in terms of processed food, in terms of sugar, in terms, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. The, uh, AMA did a study on it and basically said we're killing ourselves. The new drug of choice in our society is sugar. Uh, we're 500 to 1,000 times over the recommended dosage. They published the study. The Bush administration told them if they marketed the study, they would defund the World Health Organization and the AMA. Uh, but So the study's online, you can get it, but it's a secret. Uh, so all I'm really saying is that uh, that sort of this tension between choice, between individual and structures is actually much more complicated uh, than we think. The last thing, again, why is obesity so much worse in the black community than the white community? Uh, where we've had any success in terms of obesity, it's been in the white community. The black community, almost no success. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has spent a billion dollars trying to get people to lose weight. Uh, and when I went to talk to them, they, I told them that, told them what I told you, and they said, thanks, Professor Powell, we don't need your services anymore. Uh, their company, their board, have a number of food companies on the board. It's like, we don't like those facts. We don't, we're not even look at that. We just to tell people to exercise more. Uh, and I'll end, I know we, we're about to end, but my father, who's 96, uh, African-American, uh, that's why I'm African-American. Uh, <laughs> They're saying, we need to get black people to exercise more. And I go to Detroit, where my father lives. He can't go outside because the crime rate is so high. He can't walk around the block. If he walked around the block, if he made it back, he wouldn't have any clothes, he wouldn't have any money. <laughs> you know, so the environment actually turns out to be where whites live and what they, even poor whites, in terms of access, ac access to the built environment, is radically different than what, where blacks live. And they're saying, can me, can you convince black people to exercise more? It's like, no, we tell my father, don't open the door. <laughs>
and it shows up racially. And then they try to figure out what's wrong with black people. They're all overweight. They're not exercising. It's like they're living behind bars because of the, the way we distribute crime in this country. Uh, and, and, spur, and certainly in places like Detroit where you've hollowed out the city, you've hollowed out opportunity, uh, and a lot of bad things happen. So just an example of the, the choices we have always sort of interacting with structures, with each other, um, and yet most of the time we think about choice, we think about it at the individual level. Why did that person eat that cake? <coughs> ate that cake because they were stressed out. Thank you, Professor thank you. Powell. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Powell. I know there are a lot of questions that you would have liked to answer, but the time is officially over. But I do have two announcements for you that I think will please you. One of which is that Professor Powell had the opportunity to meet with Mayor Byron Brown, and the mayor has indicated interest in learning and bringing some of these ideas to the city. And Oswaldo Maestro, who's here, stand up and identify yourself as well. Just so you all know, the city representatives are here absorbing information and the city has signed an opportunity pledge, information about which is available online. You are welcome to look at it. And if you would like to continue reading what Professor Powell has shared, there are postcards on the table outside as you walk out and there's a web link with a curated set of readings that include his writings, but also supplemental writing readings that have been collected um, that feature these topics. So thank you for coming, and I believe there is one more announcement about a people's food movement. So there is an event on April 8th, so stay tuned for information. We'll probably send it out broadly. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you, Professor Powell. Thank you.